Hello, everyone, and welcome back to part three of my interview with Laura Schnell, um, former uh, Seminary Institute or CES teacher, instructor in Utah County. We've done two episodes with Laura. One was about her upbringing as, um, as a member of the church born in Colombia, uh, immigrated to the United States, just her, her life as a Colombian immigrant Mormon woman of color, uh, and that was an epic and important part one. Part two was all about her experience teaching seminary um, for the uh, Mormon church church education system in uh, into Utah County, and as a friend of, of Mark Osland, who is also on Mormon Stories just a couple months ago. Shout out to Mark. And we ended part two with Laura um, deciding to no longer work for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And if you want to hear that full story and you haven't listened, go listen to part one, then listen to part two. And now we're starting part three, which is basically asking the question, how does this 30-something lifelong Orthodox devout um, Latina uh, Mormon woman who is as committed and as Orthodox and as devout as they come and who taught for the CES system for six years, how in the world could she ever kind of start to question her faith? What would lead to that? And then, you know, where has that faith journey taken her? And so, Laura, welcome back to Mormon Stories for part three. Thank you. Mark Thank got you. three parts. You got to get three I know, parts, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> he told me I would, too. I was he like, did? I don't think so. He, he said, knows you me totally better than would. me. He does. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, shout out. Love you, Mark. Um, and yes. Kara, Kara Burrell, thanks hey. for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to spend the day with you guys. I am too. Yeah, and it's great to have you, Kara. You do great work for us. Thanks. And uh, thanks for being my uh, co-host. All right. So, Laura, uh, how, you know, how did your faith, you know, how did it, how did you get to the point of having a faith crisis when um, you had such a devout stalwart uh, faith and you were teaching for the CES you know, church education system for the Mormon church for six years. How in the world? Take us through that journey. Um, man, that that's... Where did it start? Where did it start? And you can I go back even... if you want with cracks and then... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, teaching seminary, you know, you're so into it that you, you have to be blind sometimes. Um, you have to choose to be blind. It's a job requirement. Mm -hmm, it's a job requirement. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but sometimes things come up that you're just like, mm, I don't know. I can't put my finger on this. Um, like I mentioned in in my last segment, uh, general authorities are wrong sometimes. That was something I could comfortably sit on as, you know, as kind of a more nuanced seminary teacher. And for those who didn't hear the first couple episodes, some examples in your mind would have been what? Um, well... The, the 2015 policy, okay, and then suddenly it's reversed. So no, that was wrong. Uh, uh, L, the LGBTQ exclusion yeah, exclusion, policy. exclusion policy. Yeah, uh, I I honestly can think of <laughs> a lot of examples. One that I shared in class one day was about how you the only way to to have true joy is through the covenant of marriage, and I said. I don't, is that true? And, and of course this is an edgy class. I could do this with this class. Um, but that was another one. And another was a conference talk that the kids didn't really like. I can't remember what it was and I didn't either. Uh, I think it was by elder Oaks actually. Um, and again, I said, you know, you guys, he, he could be wrong and that's okay. That doesn't make him not a seer or an, an apostle. He's just a human being. So I was kind of approaching it from that end. So that was little things here and there, but no, nothing really major. The one thing that did start twisting was I was in the middle of all the anxiety with trying to get lessons prepped. And I would talk to my friend Mark a lot uh, because he was just a trusted coworker and he was also becoming such a close friend. And I could, I didn't feel ashamed to say, Hey, I'm behind about 30 chapters. Could you send me a couple lessons? And absolutely. It was no hesitation for him. And he started sending me these lessons later on at the end of his career that was so, you know, inclusive and, 
equity and and kind of edgy and i was like i like this what is this um like queer eye for the straight guy <laughs> yeah i was not gonna show <laughs> queer eye but i did play tupac in class i will say and it was it went very well but you know little things like that and he sent this quote um see if i actually have it right here and i wondered what and i, I said where did you get this and it, it says um it's by father greg boyle and he says we seek we seek to tell each person this truth. They are exactly what God had in mind when God made them. And then we watch from this privileged place as people inhabit this truth. Nothing is the same again. No bullet can pierce this. No prison walls can keep this out. And death can't touch it. It is just that huge. And again, this not is not a Mormon quote, <laughs> not a Mormon quote, <laughs> be your and best you. No, no, no. God did not have you in mind when no, really, and that, see, that's what it was exactly. I said, wait, up. and it felt so good and true. And this is, it's talking about gang members in Los Angeles. So I said, what is this book? And he said, oh, it's Tattoos on the Heart. And I got my hands on it and it, it, if that is the number one, if, if people say, when did you start questioning seriously? I said, when I read Tattoos on the Heart, I recommend it to every human being. Mark makes fun of me. He's like, okay, now it's like your scriptures. I'm like, yeah, it's the best scriptures to have because I mean, and, and my perception of God has changed dramatically. But at that time, I, I saw this all inclusive, all wildly loving just accepting God who just doesn't get anxious about his children and, and their choices and who, I mean, Father Greg would say something like, God can get tiny if we're not careful. We make God fit in this tiny box when God is so expansive. Um, we judge others at how they carry, you know, difficult things. Um, we, and, and so I was like, why don't I feel this here? And that's the questions that started scaring me. That those are the questions that started scaring me is I was like, I've never heard a talk make me feel like this. It's always God loves you, but God loves you. And remember, because do this and, and I was like, I literally can't think of one talk that's just God loves you, period. The only time I remember hearing that was when Ronald Rasband, he came into my ward. He was just stopping by and he was like, I just want to say that God loves you. And he left. He was like, in between stakes or something. The only time, and it wasn't even a general, it was a ward. And that started to bother me, but I was still in seminary and I would shake those off and I would say, that's okay, that's, that's just different. Well, it's not, this is a Jesuit priest in the Catholic church. How come he can, how come he can say that? To gang members, to people who commit real crimes, not people who <laughs> cup each other's hands and feel guilty. You know what I'm saying? I, I thought, why? How? It just bothered me. It kept puzzling me. Why don't I feel like this? I would read things about this book and what he would say about God and gang members and, and intrinsic worth and love and just free flowing love all the time. No one's disappointed in you. Don't twist yourself like a pretzel to become what. And I was like, I'm not finding this here in my current religion. When I say here, I mean in Mormonism. And that started really bugging me. Um, things with the discrimination case and everything that didn't honestly it didn't do much except super disappoint me it's not like that caused a crack that definitely i feel like maybe it was easier after being out of seminary that's about all that did um but Ju julie Di i think it was julie diaz of hanks who recently made a point that being offended is actually a legitimate reason to hold something against something else like if an institution is unjust mm -hmm. the that's decent grounds upon which to judge the institution so i guess i'm just saying that you know there's always a stereotype that an ex-mormon leaves because they're offended and if mormon story stands for anything it's rejecting that stereotype because that's not why people leave generally speaking or if ever at least not the people i interview and having said all that like if the church the corporation of the president of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints treats you in a profoundly discriminatory way, isn't that, I would, I would guess that's fair grounds. 
<laughs> yeah. For questioning the church. I don't know. I would say so. Yeah. I didn't let myself, but I would say so. Yeah. I think under any normal circumstance, I would have. But that wasn't no. a big crack for you. No. <laughs> inexplicably. No, it was a crack with patriarchy mm. and with, oh. hmm, systems are off here. There's power imbalance. Oh. But not with testimony, not with brethren, not with temple, not with, no, not at all. You were able to compartmentalize. Mm -hmm. I okay. did. I, yeah. That was my way to sanity. Okay. Um, so just put it in a corner. This happened here. So. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I read that book and then I. Tattoos on the heart. Then, yep. Tattoos okay. on the heart. Then I quit seminary. And then, and before I had quit, my husband has, had been kind of, after the baby was born, our daughter, he would stay home with her more often than not on Sundays. He would say, you go to church, I'll stay. And I panicked. I was like, no, a priesthood holder needs to lead in the home. And we wouldn't read scriptures. And, and I was like, can we please have couples prayer, please? Um, and it was kind of like dragging feet a little bit. And I felt so, I was like, oh, okay, we need to talk about this. Um, come to find out I quit seminary and I start kind of being vocal about like, have you thought about? And he was like, I've been thinking about this for a long time. I just was married to a seminary teacher, so mm -hmm. I couldn't. You know, and I, I feel so bad that so many times I made him feel like spiritually inferior. And I did. I remember having these conversations like you need to lead us with your priesthood. You need to come on. Like I'm the leader right now and you need to be a um, weird thing. Um, but I think after quitting is when I, I finally let go of that need to compartmentalize to make everything make sense. And so I finally started thinking a little bit and, and saying, okay, I think in Mormonism, God has to be conditional. That's what I think. That's what I'm feeling. And, you know, the, the best and worst part about my faith journey is that very few things are logical. Like some things really are where I'm just like, okay, that doesn't add up. Come on. Like money to get to the celestial kingdom. But like paying tithing. But other things are deeply emotional where I just don't feel settled. I started to feel less settled. I started to going to church and hearing talks about conditional condition. And I'm coming from this book and these spiritual experiences of God be free, free flowing love accepts me. You know, God, you are exactly what God had in mind when he made you. This is where I'm coming from. And I'm meeting it with, the Lord needs us to be righteous servants and we need to serve faithfully and we, and talks at church and lessons. And I just became kind of uh, like not turned off just where you, you kind of, you, you avoid it emotionally. I started avoiding it a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more, but I was still pretty tight with that's okay though. Cause God is still here for me. Jesus is still my savior, the apostles and the brethren so it wasn't until I stopped wearing my garments. Uh oh. That was the big one. How did that happen? That, um, honestly, I started questioning not the temple, not my covenants, but my reasons for everything. Suddenly, I asked myself, why do I do this? And, and I had asked myself before, I've taught, I've taught lessons on, you know, the moral agency and and the gift of choice and you choose we choose god and we choose the lord and we choose our covenants and then it started hitting me wait who did i choose that or is it because that's all i knew growing up the temple that's all i'd been given growing up i was never given or you know you could just not go to the temple and get married outside the temple no it was you go to the temple and you get sealed so then i started working backwards from my garments so I asked myself, why do I wear garments? And so I started following that train of thought. And this is all by myself too. Because sometimes if I talk to people, they were already so experienced with, with this conversation. So they would be like, of course, because garments are, you know, oppressive and they represent. And I'm like, oh, I'm not there yet. And then other people who are in are like, I know sometimes they're uncomfortable, but they remind us. But so I was like, I'm going to have this conversation with myself. So mm. I just wanted to talk to myself about it, which that's was a big deal. I don't giving know. Giving yourself permission to be your own authority. Yeah. That's the biggest deal. 
for me, especially growing up, wanting my patriarchal blessing to list everything. Being, tell me what to do. Yeah, tell me what tell to me do. What to think. I'm obedient. I'm obedient. I'm yeah. so obedient. So that was the first thing I said. Okay, until I figure out why I wear garments for my own of myself, I will not put them back on. And I still believed. I still pay tithing. I still, you know, had a testimony of the church of the restoration testimony of Joseph Smith for sure. But I didn't wear my garments. I took them off. Was it also they were uncomfortable and unbearable. No, nope. I loved really? them. Yes, you loved them. I, yep. Yep, freaky. I know. Oh, this is cool. <laughs> yeah, and that's why that's why I decided to take that step. wasn't It wasn't my out. Like, God, now I can take them off. It was like I'm going to take them off to see how I function, and I'm going to question myself, and I'm going to ask myself why I do it. And until I don't have a good enough answer, I'm not putting them back on. The problem, or maybe the good thing with that, was then everything. I was like, why do I pay tithing? <laughs> And so we stopped paying tithing. And I asked my husband, I said, should we start paying tithing? He was like, yeah, I wanted to stop paying tithing a long time ago. Um, and every little thing, Joseph Smith was probably the last. Joseph Smith, the Book of Mormon is still really, it's just tied up with so much emotion and so much family and so much my mom is faithful. That one's very hard for me. Um, but anyway... That's kind of, I don't know, is that what, in a nutshell, kind of? So you you started, you basically said you're, you're going to stop doing things so you don't really have a clear understanding as to why you're doing them intrinsically. intrinsically. And it was just like a, a set of dominoes. Yeah. It was garments and then tithing and then, I guess, eventually church attendance. Yeah. And, and COVID made it easy, honestly. That was another, I think that was the perfect storm, COVID. So I was like, well, we can't, I remember getting, getting the text, church is canceled. And I just felt relief. I was like, oh. and then I was like, whoa, why do I feel relief? This is not me, not me at all. You know, please leave a comment if you also felt that as well. <laughs> I bet so many people felt like that. Yeah. But it was you, you say it's, it was, it, this is not me, but it absolutely was you. It was your inner voice. It was my inner voice. It wasn't Mormon and your husband's, me. by the way. And my, oh, yeah. Oh, he'd, I mean, he'd been. And that's something he told me. And my husband and I don't talk a lot about the church. He's He wants to be more respectful than not every time. He just chooses the safer side. A lot of deconstruction still for both of us, you know. Um, but he did say one day, because I told him, I said, I just don't know what to do. I felt like this pull, like, do I? is this leaving the church? This is what I'm doing? Is this? And he said, hey... Just remember your whole life, you've been told to listen to a voice other than your own. And I remember when he said that, I was like, whoa, why'd you say that? And he's like, well, because that's been my experience. So I was finally, I guess, listening to myself. But that's scary. That's really terrifying because I've been conditioned to question that because that's unrighteous. Maybe that's temptation. Maybe that's the adversary. Why would I want to take off my garments? But seeing as it didn't come from rebellion and that I didn't think they were uncomfortable and all that, I, I think I just went with myself. I was like, yeah, I'm just, I'm going to do this and I'm going to keep questioning. And it sounds like, because what we almost always hear these days is, and then I found an episode of Mormon Stories podcast, or then <laughs> someone told me about the CES letter um, and it, it's this intellectual domino of like, well, then it was the peepstone in the hat and then it was the polygamy and then it was the, you know, the Kirtland banking scandal. And then it was the book of Abraham and, and book of Mormon and historicity and, and anachronisms. But for you, you're saying it was literally just coming to the realization that you had been living someone else's life for you and had not been listening to your own voice. And you started listening to your own voice. Yeah. And your internal voice said what? My internal voice said, why don't you do things you want to do? And that sounds so <laughs> anti-Mormon and selfish. Like, I think the Book of Mormon okay. even says, like, woe well, unto him who says, eat, drink, and be merry, or whatever. Yeah. Like, I don't need you, God. Or Yeah. Yeah. My and Mormon it, ears feel like that sounds very selfish. It does. And I did feel selfish and it was a lot of back and forth. And I was clinging onto the givens because they're so smart and they can make it T work. Talk about that. 
I lo- I listen to them um, in person. You know, Carolyn Fiona Gibbons. Did they train Fiona? you like they did Mark? Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. What that, was that like? That that he described. I was sitting next to him during that at the Terrell and Fiona at the Gibbons. And Fiona training. Gibbons. Yeah. And what did you think about their training? Phenomenal. Why? Amazing. Just they the way Terrell and Fiona. I mean, she is just this genius, and she's just like, oh yeah, you know, God. I think it's important to to put value in friendships, not just family and things like that, that you're like, oh. And then he, he would just say big things like somebody said, well, Elder Cook said that people are, you know, not leaving and that people are coming back. And he would just refute it. He was like, well, that was probably based on antiquated data. And I'm like, whoa. So just really smart people who are really faithful. So I kind of clung. I'm like, okay, I can, I can still be faithful and not wear garments maybe. I can still be faithful and like be intellectual but really smart, but, but I'm not that smart is what I would tell myself. I'm not as smart as Terrell. And yet he stays. What does he see? And Mark and I, I mean, we have scrolls and scrolls of texts because we de- deconstructed similarly. He was, he was a lot more willing to listen to himself. I was a lot more like, but no, I, but what if I'm wrong? And he, I remember him telling me, he's like, look, man, it has nothing to do with smart. Smart does not mean smart in the way you think. And I just couldn't fit it in my head. How could someone brilliant not see these inconsistencies and these even emotional inconsistencies? Like you really feel okay with God being conditional? Really? And an all loving God, you feel okay with that? I didn't feel okay with it anymore. And so I had to learn to trust not only in my inner voice, but in my inner, just like you said, my authority. I don't want to because I don't feel like it. I don't need to have some sort of defense and intellectual written thing. That was hard for me. But. Yeah. And I think the answer is in your story. Like, why was it that your husband had kind of lost his belief, but you had maintained it and you weren't willing or able to question it until when? Until you weren't employed by the church anymore. There's this famous Upton Sinclair quote that I've quoted several times in Mormon stories. It's impossible to get a man to see a point of view when his livelihood depends on not seeing it. Why do Terrell and Fiona Givens maintain their belief? It's got to be at least somewhat tied to their employment with the church and their reputation in the church and their pensions with the church. Now, it's, that, that's not it. There could be other things because there are employees of the church that don't believe anymore and they just stay because it's their job. Yeah. Um, and there are people of just super high integrity that lose their faith while they're employees and they leave as a matter of conscience. Yeah. But, um, but uh, you know, how can we not, if, if you weren't willing to really open up and ask these questions of yourself until you weren't employed anymore and your husband was already there because he wasn't employed, you know, that has to be the explanation for a lot of these BYU professors, a lot of these apologists. It's literally their job, their livelihood, their pension, their reputation. Yeah, no, it's so true. And for me, it was way more than, okay, this is my livelihood. It was, I believed that I needed to be completely in to work well. Like it, I mean, we, we get um, ecclesiastical endorsement endorsements as seminary teachers. And so I wasn't going to lie to a bishop. And so I knew, no, I'm not questioning. And it's not like I lied to myself. I wasn't questioning. I did have some little things, but I was not questioning. But then when I was free, wait, I don't have to answer to a bishop. Then I, I let myself. So, and to uh, to be generous with the givens, or at least to say something positive, I have a really close friend who's been uh, interviewed on Mormon Stories, who also worked for CES, and he once told me he likes the fact that the givens are there because they rep- that what they provide is a soft landing, because yeah. somebody who's questioning. It may be too big of a jump to just say I'm leaving the church, but Givens Mormonism provides that soft landing on the way out of Mormonism. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like it was, you know, that's that's a main value that they offer to tens of thousands of Mormons, and uh, and it sounds like that's what they meant to you. Yeah, at they least were a soft just, cushion on the way out. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Tattoos on the heart was. I was like, okay, I can. I don't have to believe in that, but I can believe in this, and so. And, and smart people that – Eugene England, he had this amazing article that I clung to forever about how the church is just as true as the gospel, yeah. about community and beautiful things. And anyway, but for me, another big part was 
the repercussions all pointed to the reasons for me. And that was interesting. So my best friend that I told you about um, from Arizona that I asked her about the Book of Mormon on her first day of school, she, she told me she had stepped away from the church. It was during the discrimination case. And I didn't know that. I had no idea. This is, I mean, homegrown Arizona Mormon girl. And it had been three years. And she was so scared to tell me. So scared. And those things started lining up for me. You know, my, my poor mom, she saw me and she asked me if I was going to work out. And I said, no, why? She's like, oh, well, you're not wearing garments. I was like, oh, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just not wearing them right now. And she was not happy. And I started pointing that to the church. I was like, that's why. I was like, of course, of course you think this way. You have no choice but to think this way. Of course you thought I was going to judge you for leaving the church because that's what we're taught to do. That's because that's what I've done in the past. And if people are like, no, I've never been taught that. That's not true. We're, we're taught to love. And yes, that's true. But we don't know what we ingest when we're sitting in thousands and countless of Sunday school lessons and seminary lessons and talks. That's just, I, when people left the church, in my opinion, they were offended and bitter and they were not faithful enough. I can't pinpoint what talk that was. I can't pinpoint when I learned that. That was just what I grew up with. And the so, water you were swimming in. Yeah. Yeah. So things started happening where I just kept pointing back to the church. I was like, oh, that's why they, That's why my mom's reacting that way. So you started noticing the undue influence and conditioning. Yeah. That was in because you of their reactions. all around you. Yeah. Because of their reactions. I was like, wait, I'm your daughter though. And it's taken... A while and I have I've been I'm really lucky my parents are incredibly loving where my dad asked me he said do you believe in the scriptures anymore and I said not literally and he said but how can you still be a good person hmm. how he's like I would be a terrible person without the church and I was like dad that's this that's sad I zero told you that, dad. yeah right and the church that told you that and of course, like he would say no, because he did, he, ex he experienced, he left the church for a little bit, you know, kind of the teenage, I'm going to drink and do all kinds of things and then, and then come back and okay, now I'm settled. But that's not the journey I'm on. I'm like, dad, I'm not here to, I'm not 17. I'm not on this wild, wild west journey. I'm a rum springer. Yeah, this is different. And at the end of our conversation, he said, you know, I, I get the feeling that with or without the church, you're still, uh, an incredible person. So I hold on to that. That doesn't, go dad. yeah, go dad. He's, he's amazing. And that's not to say there aren't difficulties in our relationship and things that are hard and sadness, a lot of sadness and grief. But for the most part, I think whenever there's a, an adverse reaction, I point it back to the church. It makes perfect sense. Why would my mom really be that sad about me not wearing garments? It's cloth. And I'm her daughter. She's devastated. Oh. And so I start doing that with everything in it. I don't know. That's my emotional way of understanding what's happening. And I just can't not mention the most alarming thing I heard in all this was the fact that your husband had lost his beliefs but was afraid to tell his own wife. Yeah. When a, when a spouse is uncomfortable being honest with their own spouse, the person that they are married to and have kids with and love the most. If any organization makes a spouse afraid to tell their spouse the truth, that should be the, in my view, the biggest red flag of all. Yeah. Yep. And later on and now in hindsight, I'm like, of course you were afraid. You probably thought I was going to want to leave you or something. Cause that happens every day. Yeah. And so then I, I started, you know, quote unquote blaming like, that's why I blame the church on that. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. It's hard not to sound like that all the time. You know, I blame the church. But what other reason is there? I can't think of one. So. So was there ever the accompanying intellectual deconstruction with Book of Abraham, Book of Mormon, polygamy, you know, peep stones in the hat, DNA, all that stuff, Lamanite stuff, racism, Ugh. sexism, homophobia. Was there ever any of that? 
Yeah. Or are you not there yet? Or? No, no, there, there has been, I, I'm not there yet fully with Joseph Smith things. Um, so he might still be a prophet to you? Nope. He's not a prophet. No, okay. <laughs> no, okay. I just not, I just haven't dug into the, all of the you don't want to go there. intricacies. I don't know if I'm ready yet. Too sacred? No, too disturbing. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think I'm too, it's almost like, uh, okay. I always compare it to finding out you're being cheated on. And someone's like, well, do you want to know how and with who and what hotel? And I'm like, nope. Don't show me. I just already know I've been lied to. So part of me is like that with Joseph Smith. Now, of course, the argument to that is well, no, but the more you find out intellectually, you know, you can be more at peace intellectually. But we'll see. We'll see when I get there. But yeah, definitely with queer, with queer people um, regarding my students, feeling like they are absolutely whole and beautiful and perfect and realizing, oh, wait, the nuclear family, that's just a social construct. And that's a very American thing, a very American value with the nuclear family, with the church. And of course the family is important everywhere. I mean, Latinos are big to family. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, but that as being propped up in the proclamation and, and I have done that and I'm like, nah, that doesn't add up. It makes, it makes zero, zero sense. And all the sense in the world as to why you would make queer people feel the way they do. With race, that one was the first one that was the easiest for me to just, I'm out with that. Just. So let's start the Book of Mormon racism. Um, I just. Have you processed that? I honestly, for me, it's been that Joseph Smith, of course, he was a product of his time. And of course he, you know, I think he, what is that word where you, it's fantastical where it's like, ooh, and, and Indians and this and- um, Exoticized. Yeah, thing. yeah, exoticized, yeah. Um, and so it's easier for me now, before it wasn't, but for me to deconstruct that and say, of course, it's, it's his history. It's, he, he really did believe that the Lamanites needed to be humbled because they had forgotten. So they need, now here comes the tribe of Ephraim, missionaries, and- bring them back. And, and we have the book of Mormon that tells us that you were cursed because that's why you're Brown. See? And so that was hard emotionally, but easy. It kind of made, it made sense to me. I'm like, of course, um, race and the priesthood is another Wait, one. So, so in your mind, were there golden plates? Were there Nephites and Lamanites? Is the book of Mormon a history of ancient native Americans? I don't think so. I don't think the book of Mormon was a history um, of ancient Native Americans. I did read the, <laughs> I read the gospel topic essays a lot. Um, but then the fact that people are steering away from, oh, among the descendants or no longer the descendants of the Lamanites. Um, who are the Lamanites? It doesn't make sense. Yeah, who are the Lamanites? And I I really, I have an easier time without really digging in to, to say they're just part of the story that Joseph Smith had. You know, and I'm, I'm at peace with, I'm at peace with people finding peace with the Book of Mormon and with it not being true. What about the argument? The Book of Mormon is too amazing. Joseph could have never written such an amazing <laughs> book. Um, oh, I think Harry Potter is pretty amazing. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I just think. But he's an educated farm boy, <laughs> 12 years old, whatever. Stay you know. home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. a Book of Mormon evidence conference coming up that my mom oh. told me to go to. So apparently the archaeology is rock solid, no pun intended. Okay. <laughs> rock solid. Yeah. I, I haven't taken the time to really, I, I know in my gut, or I feel I should say in my gut, that this was someone with good intentions who was really good at writing things. And telling he stories. had, he telling stories. He had helpers, you know, he had people. It's not like he wrote, this isn't, journal you know this is something that was put together and who's to say it didn't bring inspiration to some you know i don't think he wrote it i don't think it's real life you history. don't think he wrote it um all translated? yeah oh yeah that's what i mean i don't think he translated but then i'm like well i don't think it was an actual historical yeah historical okay. record yeah you studied book of abraham at all yet no how about the peeps she doesn't want to know the receipts i don't want to know <laughs> I don't want to see. Yeah. Start on the hat. Um, 
That one we learned in seminary, so I had less of a, I was inoculated. So it was less creepy for me to, to read about it. I was just like, oh yeah, the hat. Now I just, I understand it, you know, with the occult and that was kind of the culture back then. So it doesn't. He was just doing occulty things. Yeah, yeah, he was just doing occulty things and that's what people did. And yeah. that's how. I'm curious, is there certain things when you are teaching seminary where your students would push back, whether it's like the LGBT policy or women in the priesthood um, that you mentioned, is there anything else that you've come around to be where you remember you're like, oh, I gave them kind of a canned answer from the church. <laughs> or that you regret. Or that, that you, you regret. Were, yeah. yeah, yeah. That you were like, actually, Torture. this 16 year old, you know, girl, uh, she totally was on and I was, I, I was wrong. <laughs> Are there certain times where you're like, oh, they had it right. I had it wrong. Yes. And the one that can, I can think of, which it just makes me cringe is polygamy. I was dead set. I was like, no, but look, and it's because my mentor gave me such a good layout for it. I was like, oh, yeah. What was your justification? Um, bring up seed. Also, all things must be restored. Joseph Smith needed to restore all things. The ancients, the ancient patriarchs practiced polygamy. So, of course, Joseph Smith had to restore it, too. What a convenient thing to restore. So, <laughs> anyway. He didn't restore animal sacrifice. <laughs> right. And so, and also... Um, viewing Brigham Young as an amazing colonizer. This was back before I thought Brigham Young was just putrid. But now, you know, back then I was like, oh no, he's, yeah, yeah. Because they were just ravished and Nauvoo and lost. And of course they needed to raise up seed. And so that made sense. So in seminary, I'm teaching polygamy and this poor girl, oh, I love her so much. I still have her face in my head. She's like, Sister Chanel, that's just, that's so gross to me. Why would God make, why would God make this a commandment for, for these young girls? Because we were talking about the essay, which meant that Joseph Smith could have slept with the young 14 year old. And I was like, well, but remember it was of God and Joseph didn't want to do it. He didn't want to, but he had to. <laughs> and she was just like, oh, I don't know. And I'm like, no, no, listen. Sometimes we do difficult things, like how Abraham wanted to kill his son. Normal. And I was just like, you know, and I remember the bell rang and she looked at me and she was like, it doesn't make sense. And she left. And I wish I could tell her, hey, never. No, it, I was wrong. And I was just like, <laughs> That'd be funny if there was like a superior in the hallway. You're like, yeah, Laura, keep talking more about that. You're going, you're losing popularity with the kids. Right. They keep were like, good. That. Yeah, that's good. You're coming good. down to our rings. Finally. Good. Keep talking about really problematic subjects. Like you're losing the kids. <laughs> so bad. Sometimes so God bad. makes you have sex with 14 year old girls. Sometimes that's what God does. That's just but how I that works. But I didn't, I refuse. I was like, no, we don't know if he slept with her. Oh, no. He just had to marry her because it was a commandment. And that's why she was like, but how do we know if he didn't? And I'm like, we hope that he didn't. But we <laughs> <laughs> it was a mess. I'm like, oh. So I'm dark. Just so Sorry I'm laughing, but man. No, think about it. Seriously. Yeah. This is just. It always comes back to the nature of God for me. Of like, you're still trying to foster this relationship with these kids maker in their minds. And you're like. Exactly. Technically, God can tell you to marry somebody one day that you don't want to marry. Like you're, it's setting up the super unhealthy dynamic. That God's like, super it, powerful and he can't figure out a better way. Yeah. Right. Than to, to, to exactly. take an angel, send an angel. Of all the things yeah. God could send an angel with the flaming sword to do, it's to make Joseph have sex with the 14 year old. It's unfortunate. It <laughs> and the, I don't know if you guys know the, the truth behind the polygamy to raise up seed logic. I actually heard is John, have you heard this as well? That, uh, the numbers actually don't work out no, they that, don't. uh, monogamy oh. produces more children than polygamy does. Per, per, um, per you know, woman, per woman yeah. espe in, uh, especially in like the Utah territory at the time. Yeah. So if God wanted to, he could have just like been making quadruplets and twins <laughs> mm. <laughs> pumping kids out. He could have done it better than taking away the That's autonomy happened, yeah. of women, but Hey, and there weren't more women than men on the frontier. There were more men. Yeah, than women yeah. On the frontier, a lot of the so apologetics that we were fed were not patriarchy. The the men wanted more women. The men in power wanted more women. Yeah, it's nothing more sophisticated than Warren Jeffs and the FLDS Church. It's nope. that's nothing. what it was. 
Yeah. And I have, I have a dear friend whom I love and I, you know, polygamy was easy for me to kind of separate myself from. Cause I'm like, I don't come from this, you know, I'm not married to my cousin. Um, and the one time in Mormonism, you were glad you weren't a pioneer. <laughs> yeah. Ancestor, uh, oh descendant. yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and she comes from, I mean, all kinds of, yeah. Hey, th- you know, these two, this, two, lots of polygamy. <laughs> And she told me once, she said, you know, this is just trauma for me. And that was another thing that I was like, absolutely. This is horrendous. And she's like, and it lives in my DNA, this need to be dominated sexually, physically, mentally by a man, because that's what God wants. And that when she told me that, I was like, I'm done. I'm done with that. She's I'm not saying it from a faithful or nope post post Mormon post perspective. Interesting yeah. post Mormon perspective. Yeah. So for that female student that you tried to um, explain polygamy to, do you have, do you want to look in the camera and say anything to her? Uh, <laughs> I just want to say I'm so sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to. I did mean it, but I didn't know better. So. And I'll be thrilled if she reaches out and says it's okay. When you know better, you do better. <laughs> if, honestly, Sister it, Schnell. it was probably multiple, to be honest. Oh, I just remember course, her face because she was at the front seat. So Six years, right? Six you years. You answer that question a lot. Yeah, I did. I did. So Okay, you were going to talk about the Black Priesthood ban really quick. Yeah, that one was another easy one for me that I'm like, absolutely racism, 100%. That one was very easy for me early on. What I mean early on is early on in my questioning, like summer before quitting, we had a a training and it was just bogus. And I just remember sitting there being like, you just, what? What was the training? What were they saying? It was saying similar to polygamy, you know, we didn't understand. We, We can't judge or blame all these people. We can't. You know, this is just what they were given. This is just a knowledge. We, we operate from the knowledge that we have, which is true. But man, this is the seven D's. <laughs> it would make sense if it was maybe slavery time. I would be like, okay, I understand. Maybe. The 1860s, you're saying. But, but literally, this is the 70s. How 1970s, are you still? Yeah. How are you? Yeah, this is 1970s. How are you still like, yeah, oh, we can't can't get them baptized or they can't go to the temple. Yeah. That's ever, they can't go to the temple, can't receive the priesthood. And these are your ancestors, by the way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yes. And so... You couldn't have been baptized prior to 1978. I don't know. I, I think I... baptized, I'd, but I th- you mean go to the temple? Oh, right. Right. You couldn't have... Okay, gone to the temple. Thank I, you. you mentioned Thank you have you. African right. blood. African blood, yeah. yeah. But yeah. I think I have enough indigenous and... European blood to, to save me to from pass. that. I think if to pass, I think it has to be a certain, I think they had some arbitrary it thing. It depends on who, because for some, it, it was not even who, a drop. Does it? Yeah. Not even a drop. Really? You know? Oh, well, I have 25% drops. But, but it was drops. Brazil and, and Latin America that kind of blew that open when they realized that people like you actually did have. Oh, yeah. You know, this is pre 23 and me. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Pre, yeah. Pre ancestry.com. Yeah. yeah. So, Anyway, that one was my husband. That's the most he's vocal on. He's like, how, how can you absolutely not face consequences? I don't care who you are. If you're before Kimball or after, how can you not face consequences in the next life? If there is one for the atrocious, for the atrociousness of that ban, you know, you literally keep someone from living a covenant that you tell them is the most important based on something they didn't choose their skin. It's, and now it's the hideous. Brother, and now the brethren say in the essays it wasn't doctrine, it was just yeah. human frailties and policies. Or they also want to say God did it and we don't know why, but... Yeah. Which is it? Yeah. Just say, ra- just say racism. Just yeah. say it. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Mm. You know? <clears throat> yeah. And I don't know. That one is very, I feel sensitive to it because I'm just like, what would have happened? I think about my grandmother, you know, the, the ancestor. I'm just like, seriously? Um, I think about my indigenous ancestors and I just, part of me in order to reclaim them and reclaim, I, I, I need I need freedom from this high demand religion. I absolutely cannot do it in the same space. Some people can and that's great. I have been way too colonized elsewhere. I'm not about to do it in a religion. Boom. Mic drop. So was it at all terrifying? 
I mean, you weren't just Orthodox Mormon. You were CES employee. Yeah. Was it terrifying to consider leaving? I mean, COVID helped. COVID did help. That was great. Yeah, it was terrifying, mostly because of what I fishbowl, you know, and what I represented, who I was to students, to parents, um, to former coworkers. Um, I had a couple reach out to me. You know, I'm not, I'm not super vocal on Instagram about it. Once in a while, I'll say something. Um, and I always love to talk to anybody, you know, who DMs me and we can talk about it all day. But I, I'm i usually like too many Mormons follow me and I don't want to hurt anybody. That's my go-to. Sometimes I'm like, mm, this is too, uh, I need to be authentic. I have to share, this is important to me. Um, but some of them have reached out and one of them said, you used to be so genuinely loving what happened. <laughs> um, and honestly, the one that bothers me the most is you must have gone through something so terrible for you, for you to lost your faith, for you to have lost your faith. And it makes me feel like that's just a fake thing. It's like, no, you're projecting. You're saying it's going to take you terribly painful things to lose your faith. And obviously I've been through difficult things, but again, it's not that because this happened, I lost my faith. It's because I looked inside. It's because I finally was like, you know what? Towards liberation and no looking back. And that's really it for me. I think it's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, this is a, it's a beautiful anomaly on Mormon Stories podcast that yours was so internal. I'm just in love. Oh. I love all the other CES letter Mormon Stories you know, faith journeys, but I love that yours was just so elegantly internal mm. and intrinsic. Thank you. It makes it, I don't know if it makes it harder or easier, but it's, you know, it's the choice I've made. But Has it been excruciating or has it been wonderful or both? Both. Yeah. Some days I feel super free. I actually, last year when I, before I was even ready to be vocal about me, stepping away I got a butterfly tattoo which is you know so basic but also it's very important to me lots of family and what does it represent? cultural um, it represents my indigenous ancestors it represents a poem that my father the one in Colombia used to read to me kind of our bond kind of reclaiming that bond it represents just change and freedom and growth which of course sounds so cliche but to me at the moment I was like this is what I want um, and it just reminds me, and it's a place where you can't really see it. And I did it purposely. I was like, I did it for me to remind me that this is about me, that I looked in and that I listened to Laura now, you know, and sometimes it's scary. Sometimes I'm like, could she be wrong? And some days I do wake up and I wonder, what did I do now that I have a baby? I'm like, am I, am I ruining? And then when I settle and when I can settle my thoughts, I can actually approach those thoughts of criticism and negativity with love and say, I know why you think this, you've been conditioned and you're scared and it's okay. You have a place with me and the true self. I think the true Laura is always getting stronger and stronger where I can trust her. So a lot of people who going back to what your dad was saying about how, how will you be a good person if you don't believe in the scriptures? Did you think that? Ever, or did you have anybody else, maybe like former uh, coworkers, just really doubt and think that you're on like a moral relativism path now? Have you had any pushback that you have to stand up for yourself? Like you were like, I intrinsically know what's right now. Yeah. Yes. My, especially my former um, mentor, he's just, he's so concerned about me and he's so worried. Um, he didn't want you to come on more stories. No, right? he did not. He told me, please don't, don't talk Anything to John. Anything but that. <laughs> don't talk to John DeLynn. It's mom stories with Kara Burrell now. Exactly. <laughs> don't, don't worry, he won't even be there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so I definitely um, have had some of them say, well, it's it's easier to choose this route because it's basically telling me it's too hard to live faithfully and it's easy to go with the times now where there's moral relativism and where the scriptures are just, you know, a choice and obedience is a, is an option. And so, 
that's kind of been hard because I feel, and I, I talk to my, my close friends about this, Mark about this, my best friends. You know, weirdly enough, this is so crazy, my, all of my best friends are out. And none of us did it together. It was more like sidestepping, sidestepping eggshells, and then finally like, well, yeah, me too. I have one- Your best friends from? From high school, my best friend from high school, my friends from BYU, um, all of them. CES, bro. Mark. Yeah. We're all out together, yeah. right, Laura? We're yeah. Now for hey, life. It's true. I mean, it's also Bond. generational. The church is literally it, it is. hemorrhaging 20 and 30 somethings and teens. Yeah. Like 80% loss. Yeah. It's. Yeah. 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 Totally. So um, I have one friend who I think is hanging on a little bit, but she's very open. I can share anything and she's not, doesn't push back. But anyway, yeah, it's hard sometimes. I talk to my friends about. I don't have arguments. I really don't. I'm like, but because my argument is that I, I've made my choice. I don't want this. I'm listening to me and well, but it's easier that way. And you used to be, and my coworker told me, he said, miracles are only for those who work hard enough. And I was like, well, I guess I'm done working for them. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what to say to that. But anyway, I don't know if that answers your question mm -hmm. at all, but mm -hmm. Definitely. Can I do a little rapid fire? Don, did you have a question? I was going to ask her just a, a couple things to wrap up. Did you have something else you want to say? Uh, yeah, but I can do it after you. Okay. Um, so since you spoke to teenagers for a living about the gospel, um, I'm hoping that a lot of teenagers will watch this, whether it's former students of yours or Mark's or whoever. Yeah. Uh, what do you have to say to Mormon youth who are in the church, but maybe have lost their faith and they're trying to still fit in a box that doesn't really fit them. Um, what would your advice be for Mormon youth trying to survive staying, you know, in a Mormon household right now? Mm -hmm. mm. Who want to leave, but maybe can't. Yeah. That they're still under 18 under and 18. have to go to seminary, but mm -hmm. trying to hope that they get cool teachers like you that don't <laughs> exist sometimes anymore. Like, oh, what would I say? I would say, First of all, you're not alone. It feels like you are, but you're not. Your questions are valid and real, and you, you don't have to have a legitimate reason to question. It's just if it feels off inside, you don't have to. You don't have to come up with all kinds of court of law. Here's my defense, attorney, you know. Um, trust yourself. I know it's scary, but but trust yourself. You're, you have an innate wildness that's been caged and just listen to it and you can do it. And there ne there can be love and and just know that when people like your parents may be or maybe leaders that you trust, maybe they say hurtful things because they just want you to stay in the church. Um, maybe learn not to take it personally in the way that they're hurting you. They are hurting you and I don't want, I don't want to gaslight anyone, you know, like don't be offended, be offended. People say hurtful things, I've been hurt many times, but don't internalize it in, in that you're wrong, you're lost, you're, you're not. You're not wrong, you're not lost, you're learning. Welcome to being a human being. Keep going, you're doing amazing. That's what I would say. Yeah, beautiful. And uh, I was also just gonna follow up, yeah, speaking of just boxes that a lot of people don't fit into, you're talking about the nuclear family and uh, I guess it was in part one where you, speaking of maybe also offense to the way that they, I think you mentioned that the priesthood not being in your home uh, was a kind of painful that, that the people would, you know, look down on your family, that they're less than if people have um, a different family structure than what the church upholds as the proper way that a family should look and feel less than while they're still trying to be in the church and they don't have a priesthood holder. Um, what, what advice do you have to people who are, who might feel like they're less than um, without having that same family structure? Or mm -hmm. single moms that feel like they uh, don't have priesthood power moms. in the home to bless the kids. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like my mom for so long, man, I, I honestly, I would say you're not crazy for feeling less than people might say, but we've never made you feel less than, or we've never taught that you're less than. If you feel less than, that's valid. It's because that's the narrative. That's the narrative. That's the water we're swimming in. Um, 
but you're absolutely the only thing that qualifies you, you know, is that you're a human with a heart. So nothing else makes you less than. Um, it's not fair because I don't believe in priesthood power anymore. Um, but if you do and there's not a priesthood holder in the home or you're, the priesthood holder is not worthy, that has no reflect on your worth or on your family's value. Um, that's an external thing and external things don't add value to, to internal beings. They just don't. They're, they're decoration. They don't add any anything. So maybe trust that. I don't know. For sure. These are great answers. I'm going to do one more. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And then John, you can go back to being the host again. Um, <laughs> we co-host Kara. Thanks. Um, so uh, as much as you feel comfortable sharing, cause you have a, uh, you know, right to your spiritual journey and whatever you feel like sharing, what do you believe in about God and prayer now and connecting with the divine? Um, and uh, you, you talked a lot about trusting your inner self. Do you do you still pray? Is there any other external way that you connect with your maker or however you view it? Also mm. Jesus. Don't forget Jesus. Oh, oh Jesus. <clears throat> yeah, Jesus is in a different box. Um, no, I love, yeah, that's a great question. Honestly, I stopped praying uh, when I was still in seminary. It was really difficult. I just couldn't bring myself to. I would pray maybe once a day. Uh <laughs> And I had this experience, and at the time I needed this structural experience. Now I don't believe in Heavenly Father or Heavenly Mother anymore. At the time I had this experience, it was really needed. I was falling asleep, and I still have it on my iPhone. I typed it up. I was about to fall asleep, and I kind of had this like thought. And of course, it's my own mind, um, and I'm totally okay with that. But at the time, I, I said, oh, that came from God. But it was Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother, and they were talking to me. And I just closed my eyes because I was like, I want to follow this. Where is this taking me? And I was in front of them and they were standing up and they were, first of all, not white. So that was comforting. And second, so just smiling the whole time. And I just said, hey, are you sincerely proud of me? Like, here I am. I don't really pray anymore. I say the F word once in a while. And I remember Heavenly Mother, you know, the figure that was Heavenly Mother at that time, she said, um, yeah, I actually love you, especially because you say the F word. And then Heavenly Father said, and we love you regardless. And in fact, you don't need us anymore. And I remember being like, what? And again, this was, this was maybe my inner self. This was my inner self trying to, to teach me something about how I don't need the external validation or factors to really determine if I'm if I'm truly a good person. So do I believe in God? Not in the traditional sense. I believe he or she, they are inside. I believe in my own divinity. Um, I believe, I read a book called Women Who Run With the Wolves. Highly recommend it. But I believe in my own wildness. I think we're all like beautifully wild creatures that have been tamed and caged and colonized. And I think there's a wild voice in us that wants to get us to break free you know, break things. And I think we should. And so I think that God and prayer, I look inward now and I still get the, I still get the urge to pray when I need something, when I'm really stressed out, my daughter was really sick. And I remember being like, what? and I just turned inside and it was comforting instead of scary before it would have been scary. Like I'm apostatizing now it's of course it's inside. Yeah. So. And an appendage on to what you just said. Do you look back at the times that you did pray or maybe you got, whether it's spiritual confirmations or felt the Holy Ghost or things, do you reinterpret those experiences now as your own power was there the entire time? How do you view your past spiritual experiences now? Yeah. Oh, that's so good because I have, I have reframed them. I've been careful not to gaslight myself in that, no, I, I must have made it all up. I didn't make of course I felt good in the temple. Of course I, I felt the spirit with this talk. Of course I felt in the ceiling room with my husband. And I reframe them now as that was the, the power of humanity. Like we, we are powerful. And when you're together in love with people, there's something felt there. Why do I need to claim it was a spirit? It was that my husband loved me and I loved him and we were doing something vulnerable. And I <laughs> felt it. Yeah. Uh, and, it, you know, and in the temple, yeah, I, I was thinking about how God loved me. 
AKA now, I was thinking about my worth and that I matter and that I'm, I have value. Of course I was gonna feel that. So I have reframed it into knowing that my intuition has been very, has been with me all along. So that's comforting that I'm not trying to put on these new clothes I don't fit into, this, that, that I'm taking things off so that I can see my intuition, if yeah, that makes sense. Absolutely, I hope a lot of people, whether they're post shelf break or wherever they are um, in the church, that they really um, take to heart what you just said, um, because I never wanna take away people's faith and what they're finding, but that a lot of people post shelf break are really nervous to trust their intuition, to really mm -hmm. um, forge their own path, uh, more morally speaking, spiritually, on all those different fronts, um, because they've never trusted themselves. Going back to what we were talking about maybe half an hour ago, yeah, yeah. Um, and giving themselves permission to do that. And I think you, yeah, I think you summed that up really beautifully. Oh, thank you, thank you. I, from an anxiety point of view, I've always, maybe not always, but a lot of times, operated from fear. Um, and I sat down with fear the other day, and I had this thought. You know, fear is is teaching me something and what is it teaching me? And, and sometimes we think fear is keeping me from something, but really maybe fear is saying, whoa, this takes, this takes courage. It's not stopping me. I used to, I used to treat fear as stopping me. Like, oh, I'm afraid to take off my garments. That means I shouldn't rather than a teacher who says, why are you afraid? What's this feeling? So I guess don't be afraid of feeling fear. And just because you feel it doesn't mean things you're doing something wrong, I should say. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, it could literally just be new pathways are being forged in your brain yeah. that have never been forged before. That's my encouragement, quite honestly, yeah. to that fear, that you know, post-Mormon fear of going out into the wilderness, braving the wilderness. Um, yeah. Brene Brown. Yeah, Brene. <laughs> <laughs> Is that like, uh, yeah, growing muscles in your brain and in your body, whether it's uh, working out or working out your brain, mm -hmm. you're still exercising muscles that you might not have done before and it might be painful but there's so much like beauty and growth and that you kind of do like you level up into an entirely different person yeah that just might be even unrecognizable yeah. um in you know a, a year or two's time so exactly um yeah i think those are a lot of beautiful words i hope people take that to heart mm -hmm. thank you i love that if if strengthening your muscles leads to pain why wouldn't strengthening your character or your life experiences cause you some discomfort yeah we too often associate discomfort with bad mm -hmm. when oftentimes discomfort is literally a prerequisite for growth, mm -hmm. I think. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm more interested in growth now in my life. I, I hope people don't recognize me. I really don't that haven't seen me in 10 years. I hope they're like, Oh, because Laura, that be that's you. <laughs> is that you? <laughs> right. Right. And that's kind of, why we, it, the butterfly thing, you know, and we've heard it a million times. There's a million cliches about butterflies, but and we get stuck on that caterpillar and we're mad at the caterpillar. Why don't you look like this anymore? Or at the butterfly, why don't you look like a caterpillar anymore? Um, and so we embrace, we embrace change all the time. And that doesn't mean it's not scary or uncomfortable, you know, even coming onto this podcast, so much fear. Who's going to listen? What's in a tank top. In a tank top. <laughs> Without your hair out. <laughs> With my With hair, your down. hair down. And not straightened. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so. I would not have it your freak, any as, other way. <laughs> right. I cannot as, imagine any other way. To quote the family stone, you're letting your freak flag fly. My have, you, have you heard that? Do you see that movie? No, I haven't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good That's, one. <laughs> it's like, it's a great holiday. It's one of Margie's favorite. Christmas movies of all time. That's really funny. the Family Stone. Check it out, Sarah Jessica. You know Parker. our church is really diverse. When it all it takes is having your natural hair down with a tank top <laughs> and to it's be scandalous. a freak. And it's, woo. You're a rebel. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know. That's that's actually another thing that kind of gets me sometimes. Is I'm like I'm literally having conversations about tank tops. This is not normal. Mm -mm. This is not normal. <laughs> so, kind of hits me. Okay. Lots of conditioning. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. everyone, be patient with yourself. Yeah, tank tops, ordering at Starbucks, all these things. <laughs> we got to learn in our thirties. Those rings, yeah. No, yeah, second ear rings. Yeah, hey, I have six piercings now, and babe, oh my gosh. Yeah. and you don't need to do anything. Yeah, do I need to show them? <laughs> you should. You don't need to do anything, by the way, that you're not uncomfortable with. Sometimes I feel like my mom's oh, yeah. like, so, so, do you drink now? And do you? And I'm like, no. 
I sip wine. I love my Welches. That's my brother-in-law calls it, my Welches. Um, Yeah, he calls it Welches because it's literally, I mean, I think Tylenol has more alcohol. And I love it. Um, And once a month, and I don't need, you know, and some people do. Some people need it. It's yours. You get to do you and you'll mess up. And you'll maybe you'll, you know, I've had times where I've said things to my mom that I'm like, that was not empathetic of me to say. And you'll mess up, but... Again, welcome to humans. You know, <laughs> so. yeah, the fishbowl is still on you. Sometimes as an ex Mormon, right? Of yeah. either your family's judging, like, ah, is she messing up? Is yeah. she drinking her welches? It's mostly the bad words for me. Yeah, <laughs> my mom's like, but she's so good <laughs> though because she swears in Spanish, so <laughs> we're equal. <laughs> but a couple of super quick questions. Uh, one is, um. So this is probably the hardest question of all. Like if you now rewind and think back to like your times in Colombia and what might have happened to you, your mom, your sister, if you had stayed there. And then also, and this is a very white privileged colonialistic question, but I'm, I'm trying to channel listeners and, and I want to give you a chance to really knock it out of the park. Um, you know, look at where you are now and you've got, you know, you now are bilingual, you now <clears throat> live in the United States, you now have a bachelor's degree and all this work, work experience. Somebody can say, what a blessing the church has been in your life. And all along the way, whether it's those loving Rama members in Colombia or... It started with the missionaries in Colombia, those, right. Those, the missionaries or the loving yeah. Rama members in Queens or the people in Arizona or the seminary teachers that loved you or the leaders that took care of you or you're just, wow, you're walking away from... Well, how ungrateful. You're walking <laughs> away from all of the ways the church has just abundantly blessed your life and you're just like turning your back to that, what, what would you say in response to that? <clears throat> yeah, you know, I say it absolutely was a blessing and is, and that nothing will ever take that away. Just because I choose a different life path doesn't mean that I feel zero gratitude or have zero affection or love for the incredible people, the incredible experiences I had or as an gratitude? active member. Or even gratitude? Yeah. Yeah, gratitude. There's something to be said about holding a paradox in yourself. And in that book by by Clarissa Pincola Estes, Women Who Run With the Wolves, she talks about this concept called descansos, where, you know, on the side of the road, especially in, in the Southwest, you see crosses sometimes. It's because an accident happened there, someone got ran over or something. And it's common more in the in the Latin American communities in the U.S. But she says that at a point in in anyone's life, you have to be able to do that. What what little deaths did you experience? And yes, you can chalk it up to because it is it's initiation and it's individuation. And well, I had to come to the U.S. because look look who I met and look what I did. And but that doesn't mean that a little part of Colombian Laura didn't die when she left at eight years old. And that needs to be honored and that needs to be seen as a tragedy and it needs to be pinned to the ground so that it no longer follows me, that tragedy, you know, and it needs to be laid to rest. That grief needs to be written a love letter to and be laid to rest. And so I feel like it's doing a disservice to me by constantly being like, but, but, but it was so good. It was so good. The church, I'm so grateful. What happened to that eight year old little girl who, who literally, for the rest of her life will never have growing up in Colombia, the relationships with her father, with her extended family, that deserves merit too. And just because I honor her and because I pin that to the ground to rest doesn't mean that all these other beautiful births don't matter. So I'm like, there's gotta be room for both. There needs to be the paradox of, of our little deaths and births. I don't know. Love it. Really, I love that. It's a good book. Right. It's yeah. so good. Sure, yeah. It's going to be in the show notes. To the mentor, CES mentor, who told you not to come on Mormon Stories, he <laughs> like says, Laura, why did you do it? I told you not to come on Mormon Stories. What would you say to him about why you felt like this is important? Mm. You know, he'll probably, you will listen. So look at you, Mike. He's right here. 
Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I keep looking at this. I keep looking at myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I just feel that I wanted you to hear my story from from a place where I felt safe. Um, and I wanted you to know that I came on because this was an opportunity given to me to be able to speak freely about what happened to me. And I need to honor, I need to honor those parts of myself who've been quiet my whole life, who've been told to stop, to stop stirring the pot, to not speak up. And this is a way of me to show myself in a way that I can be courageous and that I can speak up and that I do matter and that my liberation matters. And that does not take away the love and appreciation I have for you and the things you taught me. It doesn't cancel any of that out. You're just as part of my journey as anything else. So. And to your parents who are like, Laura, we raised you as Aww. a person of faith. Why would you dishonor us by going on a podcast and talking about your disbelief? I would say you guys raised me to be brave and you raised me to be um, such a good person. And so I credit you. I don't credit the church. I credit you because you taught me those things. Maybe the church was the vehicle, but you taught me to look at other people's hearts. Um, Dad, you are just the kindest person I've ever met, literally. And mommy, I look up to you in every way, every possible. You are strong. You are funny. You are you know, so gracious and so forgiving. And so I would say thank you for respecting my journey and know that this, again, doesn't take anything away from what you've taught me. In fact, because you taught me so many things, I can be on my own path, and I think you'd be proud of that. So beautiful. Where's mom? She's in Texas. She's in mom Texas. and dad, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, I have to ask this. Anything you want to say to Mark? Because I, oh. <laughs> I mean, Mark talked about you multiple times. And I know. It just seems like you guys had a journey together a little bit. We did. Dude, you know I love you so much. You are such an incredible friend because I could always go to you with difficult, you know, church seminary situations. And you were the only one who could understand because you lived that with me. But I can't thank you enough for always, you know, ending our conversations with saying, hey, you, you know what to do. You know exactly what to do. You just, you trust yourself. You need to trust yourself. And you, you always reminded me of that. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, to your husband, who, when you came out to him, was surprisingly affirming and supportive, <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, uh, I, yeah, this is uh, Michael. You're Could just have been very different. Yeah. Yeah. He, you are incredible. Um, you're probably literally the least judgmental person. I can tell you anything I'm feeling, uh, regarding anything and you listen, even if it's hard for you to listen, you, you respect the things that I, that I think about and the need for me to talk about them all the time. Um, but I also wanted to say that I'm sorry for ever making you feel less than, for making you feel like you weren't leading our family, for making you feel like you weren't spiritual enough. Um, but thank you for always forgiving me regardless and for not holding it against me. I'm so glad we're in this journey together. As soon as Mark Mark's interview was released, I had several current employees for CES reach out to me and say, I'm trapped. I don't know what to do. I don't believe anymore, but bad uh -huh. things will happen if I, if mm -hmm. I quit my job or step away, but I'm depressed and I don't know what to do. Oh. Um, and I do my best to put these people in touch with others who have left, but anything you would say to a current CES employee that is just trapped and feels like there's no out. Oh. And is afraid of losing their job and yeah. their income and yeah. their benefits because you've you've been through that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, honestly, I would say you can being authentic is always going to be better than the alternative. 
Um, and it's hard. And so you, you do things at your own pace and you look for jobs and you, you do what you can at the time, but it is not asked of you to sacrifice yourself anymore. You've sacrificed yourself long enough and you, you know, it will be at your pace and, and things will come up and maybe things will take a long time and maybe they won't, but the people who will reject you already have. So think about that you're the one that matters now. You know, the, a story needs to be told and, and it's, it's time to stop sacrificing your happiness and mental health and spiritual well-being um, out of fear. Beautiful. There's a there's a project called the Clergy Project. I don't know if you've heard of it, but no. but it was during kind of the new atheism kind of movements post nine eleven. There were a lot of clergy members that were losing their faith, and so some people got together and created a clergy project, which was like this shelter where they would help pastors and preachers who had lost their faith find employment. We need a clergy project within Mormonism, yeah, because I I know of people who have. Uh, been driven to the point of suicidal ideation because they're like, you know, let's just say they're five, 10, 15, 20 years into their career. Their family relies on the income and the benefits yeah. and they feel trapped, but they're literally becoming depressed and suicidal staying in. So we need to find a way as a post Mormon community to help these people find jobs. So they don't have to stay in a job that makes them want to end their life. Yeah. But so that they also can, because the church sure isn't taking care of these people. Um, you, you you haven't necessarily, is, is there anything, if anybody's got opportunities, is there anything like employment wise that you would want to just say you have needs or desires or are you feeling good? Oh, that's so kind. Honestly, I, I'm, I'm okay because I, that company that I teach English for, Luckily, I've been able to keep going and now I'm writing some curriculum for them and I'm continuing. But I I agree, though, that there needs to be that support, like a an employment specialist, but as a community where we're like, you come to us and we help you, you know, where you're not alone in this. You shouldn't have to feel this way just for the sake of working. That shouldn't. That's just not worth it, in my opinion. Yeah. So. Yeah. So hopefully there's some listener that feels as passionate about this as other leaders in the community have felt about other things. We need someone to rise up and help provide job opportunities to, not not just CES, but just church employment. Yeah, so, that'd be a really cool nonprofit, right? Like its own Mormon yeah. clergy project nonprofit. Yeah. So maybe someone's going to hear that call and do something about it. If you are a person of means or of time, and you want a really worthy cause, I think you could literally save lives and transform families if, if someone out there was willing to consider that. I think so, too. Yeah. All right. Well, I think I think we've kept you too long enough, but, but Laura Schnell, it's been so beautiful. Your you. story and your telling of your story is just simply beautiful and powerful. Thank Kara, you. agree or mm -hmm. disagree? I'm thumbs here up. to disagree. <laughs> thumbs up or thumbs Sit here up. for another hour. <laughs> no. Every story is like so unique and different. And I sit here and I just love to soak up. Like you have such a good energy in your story from start to finish. Thank from you. Queens to all of the CES stuff to like your closing and final thoughts to the people that were that you worked with and to Mark. All around just like an incredibly beautiful story. So thank you. For coming all the way from Texas, pretty much. Yeah, that's so, of course, of course. Amazing, amazing story. It was amazing. Anything else you want to say? <laughs> well, there was just one last person I wanted to to thank, and that's my sister. She has been the number. Oh yeah, one. we have to come back to her. I yeah. asked about her. Yeah, yeah, you did. She literally was the only person um, that I think I could. I was the most worried about because I, example, 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 but that I could be so vulnerable with and that every single time I spoke anything, even if she might've disagreed, she always said, I'm here to listen and I love you always. She didn't say, I love you no matter what, or I love you in spite of, she always said, I love you. I love everything you're saying. 
Um, even if at the time she might have been like, hmm, that's different from what I think. So anyway. She's the RM. She's the RM. Yeah, yeah. And so I just want to, I wanted to tell you that I love you, Aleha. And I want to thank you for being here, seriously, since day one. So that's it. Beautiful. All right. Well, uh, thanks again, Mark, for uh, letting us know about Laura and for being her friend. Yeah. And for your amazing story and all you're doing. And uh, Laura, this has been beautiful and powerful. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been amazing. Kara, it is so wonderful to have you as a co-host. Thank you for being a co-host. Thanks. I am the luckiest person in the world. Like, <laughs> oh, this is my job. What is somebody pinch me? Somebody wake me up. I get to spend all day with you guys. Oh. What do we have? In, so what, do you awesome. have what does our audience have in store? Like what, what are your plans for you in this role? Anything you want to say about that? Oh, like our new projects or just anything, anything you, I mean, I'll just be honest. Like there was a Reddit thread, ex Mormon Reddit thread, which I loved, which is like, why isn't Kara doing more? Why doesn't John let her do her own interviews? Why is she like speaking less than John? And I have I, no know. idea what you're talking about. I totally don't search my name on the <laughs> on Google. We, you never saw any of these. <laughs> we don't. We don't search Reddit for letting people, you know, have a, a finger on the pulse of what ex Mormons are saying about us. <laughs> no, yeah, I did see that, and it was kind of funny that somebody was like, "Kara should speak more," and then we definitely have a lot of people who are like, "Kara should speak less." But <laughs> um, the one, the episode of Kelly's just aired, you know, uh, yesterday where I sat in the host chair and um, I will, I, I joke that I'm trying to replace John Dillon. That's a joke. I cannot, <laughs> I will not, but I am very happy to add my voice and my perspective and just, yeah, ride co-pilot to John as much as I can. And, uh, and uh, what I mean, I, in developing your own, like doing your own interviews, right? Like we both want that, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, as much as much <clears throat> good content that people are willing to listen to and invest in. Uh, it's I know sometimes podcasts are long and it's difficult, but we want to cover as many different angles and topics and things as we can. So just like outsourcing, <laughs> John's <laughs> only one person, so I can do a lot more as well. So this is just going to lead into thank you donors. Thank you donors for uh, your monthly or weekly or yearly subscriptions to the Mormon stories podcast. And it really goes to keeping all of this alive. So if you are not a donor, please become one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I want Kara to lead her own interviews. And so I'm, I'm, I don't want to say I'm challenging her, but that's something we're working aggressively towards. Uh, and uh, she's doing great. And, you know, and there, there are people, I'll just, I'm going to address this. There are people who are like, oh, John, why did you fix what wasn't broken? Why did you have to bring somebody else on? And, oh, Kara, you know, blah, blah, blah about her style or whatever. Like, I feel really good about this decision. Um, I feel really good about having care here. I really feel good about what she adds. And uh, I think it's really important. And I know it's different. And I know sometimes change is hard and difficult. But what we're doing here is really important because, you know, and this isn't a new thought, and a lot of people have expressed concerns about this over the past 15 years, but it's important that we have representation in podcasting. And I've tried to elevate female podcasters in the past, and we don't just need it to tokenize them. We need their voices. We need their perspectives. And I'm just really happy to have Kara's wisdom, her work ethic, her character, her charisma, her humor, uh, and, and so I'm proud to be doing this. I understand if it's hard for some of you, but please just, instead of just dissing her or us when you don't like, by the way, the overwhelming feedback has been super positive. People love Kara. I think I'd probably send you five or 10, you know, screenshots a day of people fawning all over you, uh, and loving what you do. Thank you. And there are critics. And I just say for critics, don't just take a dump, like actually just say, Hey, <laughs> This part of this time code, you know, I didn't appreciate yeah. the way, you know, give us, give us feedback and give us time. Genuinely. And I genuinely <sighs> mean that um, because if people listen to this podcast, you probably agree with a lot of the things we're talking about. I know that you're, you know, not just a critic out to be a critic and you probably are even a donor and want to invest in the best content possible. I want to invest in the best content possible. And I can only do that with constructive criticism between John and me. Uh, moving forward. So genuinely, if there are, you know, certain timestamps where like Kara said something that was out of line or John said something that was out of line or, you know, had the wrong tone, like we do want to hone it in like genuinely. 
And for and for people that like for the super minority that that like has criticisms of Kara, go back and listen to my first ten episodes, <laughs> right? Or my first he was eating two hundred or three hundred episodes. Like <laughs> he's like this. <laughs> what's that? He was eating, eating in them. He's I like, did sometimes. I did sometimes eat. Yeah. So <laughs> Tell me about your grandma's death. <laughs> <laughs> was that tragic? <laughs> I'm a busy guy. I work at Microsoft. <laughs> No, I mean, like, like this is not an easy job and, uh, it's hard to do all the things we do. And so just give us constructive feedback and it's just going to get better. Give us time and patience. If you, if you're working to adjust, but mostly thanks to everyone who's been so gracious and supportive and, and yeah, this is a financial investment to not only invest in Gerardo and Brooklyn, you know, we, we've been able to, we had a good couple of years, so we're investing in Kara. And so if you value having a female voice, if you value having Gerardo, Brooklyn, higher quality audio video, you know, all the shorts on, on the Understanding Mormonism YouTube channel, the new TikTok channel, the new Instagram, you know, influence, and we're getting tons of new listeners through Instagram and TikTok. If you value all that and you're not a supporter, please step up and support it. And that's the way you keep Kara and Gerardo and Brooklyn and all the new uh, platforms thriving. So thanks to the people who support us. Please go to mormonstories.org, become a monthly donor today if you want to see this stuff continue. And if you're frustrated, just give us constructive feedback and we'll just get better and better. So with all that, uh, love you guys. Thanks again, Kara. You're amazing. But most importantly, thanks, Laura. Thanks to, <laughs> I'm going to say it one last time, yet? Laura Marcela <laughs> Garcia yeah. Gomez Runyon <laughs> Deschner. There it is. Thank you so there much. <laughs> Thank you, guys. This was amazing. Thank you for this opportunity. All right. And we'll see you guys all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Email us at mormonstories at gmail.com. Follow us on all the platforms. Give us lots of comments and feedback. We love it. See you guys again soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>